is up ds3 tv we are back for another video and this one is Genghis Khan part 3 the debut of Temujin Khan and yeah so we are at part 3 of this extra credits series and you know we're gonna keep moving along got two other series that we're gonna be you know that we're gonna be doing today uh definitely not finishing up <laughs> um, by any means but uh yeah so yeah we're halfway we're halfway through the I like the um excuse me Dodachi Diodachi Wars. So yeah. Um let's get into it and play. A tragic beginning, a daring escape, and a rise to power. The step has come to life with gossip. Could young upstart Temujin be the one to defy custom and unite the Mongol clans under one ruler? Rumors of Temujin's daring escape from Jamaica's band traveled fast across the steppe. Respected prophets and religious leaders began to report that Temujin's ascension to power was destined by the spirits, and uh. Temujin was 100% okay with that. He summoned his followers to participate in a council called a Kurultai, which was essentially an election. Families, lineages, and clans voted by showing up. Their presence served as an endorsement, or their absence as a vote against him. Attracting a simple majority counted as a victory. Unfortunately, the turnout was scarce. The majority of steppe lineages still supported Jamaica. Temujin could work with this, though. Having now gathered all of his allies in one place, he consolidated this small but loyal group to establish himself as a minor Khan. And thus, Temujin became Temujin Khan. He quickly sent an envoy to Ong Khan to reassert his loyalty and seek his patron's blessing, reassuring him that this new title was not meant as a challenge. Ong Khan was fine with it. He preferred that Temujin and Jamaka's ambitions stay focused against each other instead of him. With his patron's blessing secured, Temujin built up a revolutionary system of government within his tribe. A Khan's court was known as an Ordu, or Horde, and traditionally the Khan's Horde consisted exclusively of his relatives, and served as a kind of aristocracy over the rest of the tribe. Temujin, however, assigned positions of power based on loyalty and ability, without regard oh. for familial ties. He appointed butchers, cooks, archers, guards, and keepers of prized herds of livestock and horses. He also created an elite regiment of bodyguards to surround his camp at all times. Jamaka, meanwhile, still refused to acknowledge Temujin as anything other than an insolent upstart who <laughs> he was treating like a little brother. needed to be put in his place. He carefully planned and bided his time, waiting for just the Which, I will say, is a bad thing compared to what he did to his last older brother. The right moment to take Temujin down. That moment finally came a year after Temujin's Kurultai. One of Temujin's followers killed one of Jamaka's distant relatives during a cattle raid, and Jamaka used this as a justification to attack Temujin's camp with his vastly superior army, quickly routing Temujin's forces. Then, to prevent them from regrouping and retaliating, Jamaka perpetrated a horrific show of revenge, beheading one of the captured leaders and boiling 70 captive prisoners alive. Oh, wow. Unfortunately for Jamaka, this cruel show of force backfired hard horrifying even his staunchest allies. By treating his enemies this way, he further emphasized the divisions between the old aristocratic lineages and the abused lower classes. Yeah. Temujin may have lost the battle, but this moment was a turning point in terms of public support and sympathy. More families flocked to join Temujin's camp, and he slowly began to rebuild. In 1195, a 33-year-old Temujin would be handed an unexpected opportunity in the form of a foreign raid. A group called the Jurchid approached Ong Khan asking him to raise an army and attack their enemies, the Tartars. For this raid, Ong Khan enlisted Temujin's horde. Now, Temujin had much to gain from this venture, so he gathered support of his own. He approached a small clan directly to the south of his camp, the Jerkin, and offered them spoils and glory in exchange for participating in the raid. The Jerkin gave their word. They were in. Okay. Shortly before the raid, Temujin invited the Jerkin to a feast. Unfortunately, during the celebration, Temujin's half-brother Belgate spotted two Jerkin attempting to steal horses. Uh. He identified one of the thieves as a renowned wrestler named Buri, and readied himself to fight the man as an equal, thinking that they would wrestle honorably. 
Instead, Bori drew his sword and cut Belgate across the shoulder. Oh. A grave insult. When the rest of the feast heard about this, it turned into a drunken brawl. And by brawl, I mostly mean food fight, because in keeping with tradition, everybody had left their weapons behind. Needless yeah. to say, when the time came to set out on a raid against the Tartars, the Jerkin never showed up to help. As with the Kurultai, absence constituted a vote of no confidence in Temujin. Victory was swift and easy all the same, and the spoils were astounding. The Tartars had access to manufactured goods from the Chinese Empire, including silk clothes and blankets and gold and silver jewelry. Captured children wore luxuries the likes of which the ragged Mongols had never seen on anyone, let oh, alone wow. a child. The opulence was astounding. But more importantly, Temujin saw clearly how the powerful Jurchid had just used one border tribe to fight another. And the lesson was clear. A tribe conquered today will rise up and have to be defeated again in an endless cycle of warfare with no decisive victory or lasting peace. Temujin will remember this. With his newfound wealth, Temujin was now prepared to push into the territories of smaller neighboring tribes. When he returned home to discover that the Jerkin had raided his camp while he was away, picking his first target became very easy. Now that he was an experienced, battle-tested commander, Temujin and his mounted archers scattered the Jerkin with ease. With this victory in hand, Temujin instituted another revolutionary change in ruling style. See, in the traditional cycle of Mongol raiding and counterattack, the defeated tribe was looted and a few key prisoners were taken, but the rest of the tribe was left alone. Historically, those survivors would then regroup and strike back, or seek out larger rival clans to join. Of course, because then they have their own revenge, so... Temujin decided that this cycle was not in his best interests. After defeating the Jerkin, he summoned a Kurultai of all his followers and conducted a public trial of the aristocratic Jerkin leaders. For failing to fulfill their promise of joining him in war, and for raiding his camp in his absence, they were found guilty, and Temujin had them executed. After this, he went on to occupy the Jerkin lands and redistribute them amongst his followers. He then integrated the remaining Jerkin citizens into the households of his own clan, not as slaves, but as full members in good standing. He also adopted an orphaned Jerkin boy as his brother, giving him to his mother, Olun, to raise as her own son. Then, as a final show of force, Temujin summoned all of his followers, including the newly adopted Jerkin, to a feast. For the event, he also summoned Bori, the wrestler who had started that great brawl by stealing horses and cutting Belgate. Temujin ordered the two men to wrestle. Bori had never lost a match in his life, but oh, wow. he feared Temujin's wrath and allowed Belgate <laughs> to throw him. Normally, this would mean that the match was over, but Belgate and Temujin had made their own plans. After winning, Belgate set upon the defeated Buri and broke his back. Oh. With this final merciless display, Temujin had rid himself of all the Jerkin leaders and sent a clear message to all who might oppose him. If you surrender to Temujin and remain loyal, there are great rewards to be gained. But if you betray him, there will be no mercy and nobody, not even aristocrats, are safe. Which makes sense because, I mean, think about it, why would, like, <laughs> I will say, honestly, Genghis Khan, he, like, it makes sense for him to do that because he was, like, yeah, like, if you met, if you, you know, you did too much, he would feel like that, yeah, that you, that you needed to, you know, get, they need to get back at you and get back at you harder. And so that way you couldn't come back and fight him again and, you know, eventually kill him. You couldn't do that. I don't, um, you know, I'm just, I'm saying that now, not seeing the whole thing, so I don't know how that's going to turn out for him, but I can see why he's doing that now. Temujin moved his base of operations into Jerkin territory, continuing to conquer and attract lesser lineages. Meanwhile, Jamaka worked to establish himself as a leader and advocate for the aristocrats, who feared the threat Temujin posed to their traditions and way of life. Then, in 1201, once he had the full support of the aristocracy, Jemuka made a play for the title of ruler of all Mongols. He summoned his own Kurultai and successfully bestowed upon himself the title of Gur Khan, an ancient and revered title which meant universal ruler. Oh. This was a strategic choice. Jamaka chose this title not just because it was ancient and respected, but also because the last person to bear the title was Ong Khan's uncle, who had ruled until Ong Khan revolted and killed him. Jamaka was not just challenging Temujin here, but Ong Khan as well. 
If he could win this war, he would be the supreme ruler of the Central Steppe. As Temujin's patron, Ung Khan came out personally to lead his warriors in the campaign against their rival. The battle was as much psychological as it was physical. Shamans lined the rocky cliffs along the battlefield, beating ritual drums to summon supporting spirits and control the weather. As they beat their drums, a massive thunderstorm gathered, which both sides attributed to the shamans supporting Temujin. This shook the resolve of many of Jemaka's warriors, and caused many to desert in fear of angering the spirits. Jamaka was forced to retreat. Ong Khan chased after Jamaka and the main part of his army, while Temujin gave chase to the Taichut, one of the clans loyal to Jamaka and, coincidentally, the clan that had abandoned him and his family decades before. Uh -huh. They proved difficult to defeat. Both sides fought for hours, firing from horseback, from fixed positions behind rocks or hastily assembled barricades. Toward the end of the day, a poisoned enemy arrow struck Temujin Khan's neck, knocking him unconscious. Darkness fell, and both sides made camp on the battlefield to rest until daylight. Thanks to the aid of his loyal second-in-command, Temujin recovered by the next morning. The Taichut didn't even know that Temujin had been injured, and most of them had fled in the night. Temujin sent his warriors in pursuit, and, as with the Jerkin, publicly executed their leaders and integrated the rest, taking over their lands. He also found the family who had helped him escape 30 years prior, and freed them from their servitude. Temujin had won this fight, but Jamaka escaped Ong Khan and fled to more remote parts of the steppe to regroup and recruit new allies. Even without the Taichut, Jamaka still had many clans loyal to him. The final showdown was yet to come. Ooh. This is gonna be a big showdown with him and his older brother. Man, this is gonna be wild, but yeah. So thank you guys for watching the video. Subscribe to the channel. We want to get to 1,000 subscribers by my birthday. And um, yeah, talk to you guys in the next video and peace.